Merry Christmas. <laughs> Welcome to Santa Herter. Fresh. I had the beard. I figured I have, I have to find the hat, you know? Like yeah. Dwayne well, Reed. <laughs> $9.99. <laughs> Fresh from the shoot of Moby Dick, in case you're wondering. <laughs> Captain Ahab, I presume. So. <laughs> I'm going to start with a few questions about the yellow handkerchief and uh, then a few about your career, and, and of course we'll take questions from this audience. Um, I was wondering what the effect might have been on you of shooting this particular story in the post-Katrina landscape of Louisiana? Because th there are so many moments where I felt that the environment seemed to almost be externalizing that loneliness and alienation that you and the other two characters felt. Could you talk a little about being in that space for the story? In rehearsal, we, uh, we started talking about that. And we geared uh, the first drive across the boat down on the side of the Mississippi uh, to that entire event and tried to bleed it into the, to the, to the frame. Chris Menges is the shooter, yeah, yeah. and one of the greatest shooters in the world. And um, I had done another film with him a long time ago called... Um, Second Best. Second Best. Yeah. And he was directing that. We did that in Wales. So he, were, he and I were old friends. In fact, I had a house near him for four years in Wales, and I used to take my boys up there. And, um, so Chris uh, really pulled that whole world, the whole remnant, of that storm into the ambience of the film from the beginning, but not with, with, no, with no ostentation. And uh, that's what makes him uh, great. But I think you too, I mean, for example, the way you tell your tale in that abandoned house. Mm. In other words, it, there was a sense I sometimes felt that um, the actual space and the characters were inseparable. In other words, that, you know, the, the kind of um, feeling, the temperature inside the body and inside the rooms or in the outer landscape. Um, if you had done that same speech, let's say, that, uh, telling the story in another place, might it have been different? Or? It always is different. Everything is informed by where you are. So there's two things going on. There's an idea, uh, intention and idea, and there's your given circumstance. I think, what is it, Declan Donnellan talks about the senses and imagination. So in art, there's two things that are happening all the time. There's what you're being given, and there's what you're saying with what you're given. And um, of course, the environment. Sometimes you see actors, they don't pay attention to their environment at all. It's like they're dislocated from it. To me, if you're dislocated from your environment, you're dislocated from yourself. So um, they had picked the set very carefully, and it was gorgeous. So we moved in. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it worked, I can tell you, you that. Um, when you first got involved with the project, were you drawn more to the script, to the idea of working with Chris Menges again? Or, and you also had worked before with Erin Dignam, who wrote the screenplay, because mm. she directed you in a film called Loved. I mean, what, or was it the character? Did it speak to some part of you that resonated? I had always, I mean, I, in fact, I had spoken with Erin about it long before when we did Loved. Um, I, I think Erin is one of the great, great writers, American writers. <clears throat> and she writes so true to character, which is um, what an actor seeks. Um, but I had, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly, thanks to my mom, who lived around the block from here. Um, I grew up around here. I grew up one block from here. <laughs> and so this is the big Local circle. boy makes good. <laughs> well, I was just looking at the fire hydrant. We used to hang out on hot days. It was like... Very, very, we used to skip to RKO from 90th Street. Um, she writes to character, and in this case, a lot of people give me words, because I like words, and um, I love words, and I love English words a lot. In this case, here was a guy who didn't have a lot of words, which for me as an actor uh, was a, just a particularly... Um, great sort of pleasure hmm. to speak a lot without talking too much, which is one of my problems. But. 
Well, there's a wonderful scene, for example, when towards the end you're in the diner with Gordy and Martine, and it's the way you glance at them, seeing their charged looks with one another, they have just slept together, and you, there's not a word spoken, but just the eye exchange with Gordy, for example. Now, is that the sort of thing that was in the script, or it comes out in rehearsal, or improvised? Because I think a lot was said without verbal. I believe there's two parts um, to every character. And one is the 10% and one's the 90%. The 10% is what you see, and the 90% is what you don't. The 90% is what you rehearse, 10% is what you show. And, and so that 90% has to be there. Now, the film industry really is not, in, you know, is not used to granting that. So you have to fight for it, because the craft of acting, the craft of what's below the surface is not um, is not its, its, its thing. Um, we did rehearse. Everything good comes from rehearsal. Everything good comes from preparation. Everything good comes from consideration. I think art is consideration. I don't think there's anything else that it is. If it's good. Um, if it's art. Um, so really what had happened, we walked into the diner. The given circumstances of, the pre of that previous scene, I remember in the day, we were asking, I was asking very clearly what happened because there was a question. The way we shot it, there was a question whether or not my character was particularly aware of what they had gone through. So was he discovering it as they sat there or did he already know? Was it confirmed or was it not confirmed? Was he covering it or was he not covering it? Was he admitting it or not? Was he facing the fact that it could be statutory or not? Um, there are lots of questions there. And, and, and so the, we, what we played was discovery. And that was good, because they then reveal themselves as people who own their event. And he's allowed in on it only because they allow him to be. And uh, that made it much more considerate, much more moving for him, and much more propelling for him to make his own decisions as an adult. So he's learning how to be an adult from people who are far younger than him. And uh, that was one of the things that moved me so much about this career. Yeah. Now, you mentioned having to fight for rehearsal. Forgive what might be an ignorant question. How does one fight for that? I mean, do you and the actors insist on it, or is it something that becomes contractual? Or what do you do? It's almost impossible to, con to put it in a contract. Um, for some reason, there's a lot of resistance to putting into contract what I would consider to be standard rights, like paid, rehearse, paid for rehearsal. You know, I'm not, not maybe paid for your principal photography, which you, you know, what you command for that particular um, commodity, but for your preparatory process. That is something which is not honored by the institution of the film industry as a, as a standard at all, and never has been. But people like Paddy Chayefsky honored it. Mm. Paddy Chayefsky was my hero. He's the reason I'm in film at all. Your very first film was Altered States, yeah. which he wrote. Yeah. And, yeah, and I had not wanted to make film. I, wanted, I was very happy doing what I was doing. I was working off-Broadway. I was working repertory ensemble. I was extremely happy doing that. And then I saw, uh, I, I read Altered States. And my particular mind had already been querying exactly down those seams of of questioning that Patty was on. It was like he had written everything, it was like he'd written everything I was thinking about. So I couldn't kind of, st after I read it, I couldn't stand up for about 45 minutes. I was shaking so hard. But I didn't want to face uh, filmmaking much. I didn't want to face fame, and I didn't want to face, because uh, it's not easy for me. I'm thin-skinned and I'm not happy with it. But, um, but I love good work, and I love talented people. I can't. I can't stay away from them. I don't want to stay away from them. <laughs> he was really a great man. He, he owned his own work, which is completely outside of the standard Hollywood um, paradigm. Most of the time, and since the 20s and 30s, Hollywood's been buying the writer's work, and then they can change any word they want to. They can, they, can, they can redo it any way they want to. They can slap the writer's name on it and say that's what he wanted to do with it, but that's not what the writer wanted. So it's a big, you know, it's a big problem. 
um, enfranchised artists is the issue. He always owned his own work. He always insisted on rehearsal. He insisted on being on the set and at rehearsal. I mean, he broke every mold you can break. And he was the greatest writer of his day in film, for sure. So he was a great hero for me, and, how, and had been, because I knew this about him, that he, he fought for those standards. And, um, and because of him and because of his, he, we got it for Altered States. And I had that in my contract for many, many films. So how do you fight it? You, you try to get them to understand <laughs> first. And then you find yourself sitting at tables with, you know, with your contract, which may be this thick, and your script this thick, and then there are a lot of empty chairs around there. Mm. And you ask the producers, where are my peers? And they say, contract disputes. And you're going, what? My contract's thicker than theirs. Well, yeah, let's that's get on where with art and industry have a rather tense relationship. That's right, it's the oil-water problem. Yeah. And, um, and it's, it's a real problem. Actually, was there not, because I think Mark told me about this, that Paddy Chayefsky, uh, his contract stipulated that not one word of his dialogue could be changed, not which is word. pretty atypical mm -hmm. in film. Mm -hmm. But Ken Russell, being the rather, shall we say, autonomous artist that, that he was. Or capricious. He could do capricious. He could do things like, for example, change the pace at which it was said or have other things taking place. In other words, he could kind of squeeze it. Or he could do to the screenplay what I think Gordy in the film does to the... <laughs> Mm. camera, the mm. crushed, you know, film that he takes to make mm. it his own. Um, were you sort of, did you feel caught in the tension between yeah. Chayefsky and Russell? No question. I mean, it was, it was, it was fraught with tension. That, that, that. Arthur Penn was going to direct that film. And I signed up with Arthur Penn. Mm. So it was Arthur and Howard Gottfried and Patty. That would have been a different movie. <laughs> it was a different thing. But I think what happened was, this is what I concluded later on, was that Patty had got the word that he was dying of cancer. And he didn't want to tell anybody. So what happened was, he really, he, what he thought was, Arthur can't direct this fast enough for me to, to bring it in him before I die. I think what he did was move to the director. He thought we'd get it done. And then what, what happened was, Ken actually, actually <laughs> pushed, delayed more. There was a fight. I think it was a fist fight between the two of them in a closet <laughs> on, in an Italian restaurant the third day of shooting, there was a little pantry in this little tiny Italian restaurant and they actually were fist fighting in this thing. I'm going, where am I? <laughs> I'm going, what's going on? That's an altered Every, state. <laughs> everything, I, it, was, it, was, uh, it was difficult. Then Patty left the set. And there were things that happened after that that taught me a lot about Hollywood, and uh, as being, you know, mugged here did. <laughs> but this was easier. Yeah, I, I can imagine. And I'm sure most of you know this, but Paddy Chayefsky, his career includes screenplays like Network, so you can understand a little of his very keen cynicism having lived through a lot of what the media has become. I don't think he was a cynic. I think he was a, a, a faithful man. I don't think he was a person who had decided it was all bad. I think he was a person who fought for what's good. And he was a great man to me. He was a, a truly great man. Yeah, I take it back then. No, it's okay. I, don't, he, he, I think he had a, a wonderfully and appropriately corrosive view of aspects of the TV industry and network and of the He film was industry. gnarly, but he, yeah. was, he, was, he was happy because he was right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that works. <laughs> now, this film, I was quite surprised to learn, is a remake. Um, there was a Japanese film made in 1977 mm. called The Yellow Handkerchief. I've never seen it. I was curious whether you had. No. No. I don't. It's, it's tough because if you don't have enough rehearsal, you can't get other images out of your mind. Right. I'm very careful about the images that are powerful to me that might distract me from an indigenous... Uh, experience in a project. Right. I'd be very, very careful to use written material, for instance, a book, as character reference and inspiration, rather than uh, uh, trying to do the book in film. Film drama is an indigenous art form. It is its own thing. It's its own plant. It's its own flower. These other uh, other arts are indigenous to themselves. You can't make a film out of a book. You can be inspired by it. 
You can um, use it for reference material. You can use it as a window into your own research. But you cannot copy a book onto film. You can't do that. That's theater is theater. Literature is literature. So um, no, I was very worried that I wouldn't have enough rehearsal to transcend the, Im the power of the images. Mm. I don't want to do something else, or a copy of, or, or I want to do this. So the first obligation you have is to the, it, your primary responsibility is to the uniqueness of this event with your fellow artists and this script. And uh, sometimes you have to set some things aside and you worry about that. But. Okay. Now, one of the reasons that I find your performance, as well as the, the other actors, I think they're all really wonderful, is um, the restraint. I mean, th there's some beautiful understatement in so many of your scenes. I'm curious whether in the rehearsal process, a lot of what you do is indeed a kind of paring down. In other words, because I can imagine that in a first reading of a script like this, one might be tempted to go for slightly bigger motions or sounds. And mm. if you could talk a little about how the character evolved. Well, it's all based on an examination of given circumstances. I mean, uh, you know, um, you never want to repeat anything in any scene. So if, um, if you're showing something, you're faking it. <laughs> if you're coming from an understanding, then you're not showing anything, you're doing something based on that life. So the idea is to create a life to imagine a life. And imagining a life against criteria which are, are more demanding than shoddy superficial criteria or you know, exhibitionist criteria or you know, anything that is um, degraded like that. And we, we went back and we found, I found things about his, his origins that made him quiet, that made him a worker, that made him valuable in ways that, that I have valued people that I have worked with in my life. Um, on a sheep ranch in Australia or driving a truck, which I've done, and or, or the people I've met along the way, people who walk on the other side of, of the avenue from me, people who will never be uh, famous, but whose lives are richer than yours might ever hope to be, people who go unnoticed, but, um, but are the greats, the great unseen. So I made it very specific about his family, and I made it very specific about his origins, I made it very specific that he was not from that part of Louisiana, made it, but from, actually from Kentucky. I changed his accent to something that was southeastern rather than Midwestern South. Um, and that he had made a, a, when he describes the horse event, uh, that event took place elsewhere for him. In the film, it's staged in Louisiana on the side of the dike, but it's actually something that was from his other life. Then he was looking for a jump, some way to make a big change. So then he comes from another locale, a person without a lot of uh, privileges, but who wanted a change in life, a chance you know, to transcend, um, which is what a lot of people want and a lot of them are stopped. So I wanted to speak to that. I wanted to speak to the fact that a lot of people get stopped before they start. And, um, and that he had made this, this valiant attempt to transcend those, what my son was calling uh, yesterday, uh, the people who never get taught that they are even allowed to have a chance. And, um, He's the one who brought the hat, by the way. <laughs> so, he's afraid to embarrass me left and right. Um, so that you saw that he'd made a, a stab at it, but failed. That in the spasm of freedom, he'd lost his coordination. And that he'd, he'd, he'd tried for love, too, in the middle of that um, jump, that leap that he tried to make. And he got caught on the horns of a lack of local coordination. And, 
and an accident happened. And he knew that one of the rules of life was to accept responsibility for what happens. So he followed that course. And, and then you, 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 know, you, you hope and pray. So I wanted that to be evident in him and not to have to show it. And so that's what rehearsal is all about. Rehearsal is really my flag, you know. It's what that I'm going to the. It's what I'm going to go into the ground with. And <laughs> I, forgive me if I ask this, but exactly how many weeks of rehearsal? Because we hear the term, and I don't know whether a lot of rehearsal means a few days, a few weeks, or more. To uh, me, the minimum, the minimum. Um, and it took me 15 years to figure this out was if it takes a woman nine months to have a baby, it takes me six weeks to have a character. So six 42 days to, have a to, to, to begin to have the structure of a character, to feel mm -hmm. comfortable enough with the material, given circumstances, history of character, relationships, sensory awareness, all of the pieces. Mm -hmm. And then you begin the next segment of research. So I don't see it as rehearsal performance, I see it as rehearsal, rehearsal. I see it rehearsal with people learning to trust here quietly, and then you come in, and I rehearse with you. Because you're equal to me. I, my, I don't see any difference between the audience and the actor at all. The leap of faith is exactly the same. The suspension of disbelief is exactly, requires the same exact amount of courage. So I don't see any difference. I don't see me doing it for you. I don't see me making you think or feel something. I, I see me sharing a question that I, I have, and therefore I'm, you might have. I'm the laboratory of, a, of human experience that I was given, so I must ask that condition my questions as a human being. Those are the things I share with you. And is it the same for you whether you're doing stage work, film, Absolutely. or television? Absolutely. There's no distinction to be no, made. No, 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 no. It's all, that's all time and space problem. That's all abstractions. So it's all a, so geometric abstractions. It's like, the difference between this audience, for instance, and no microphone, I'd have to talk like this. But I could make it work. And then the truth would be told within that shape. The truth is told in a different shape. If it's an 85 millimeter camera rammed up your nose, it's a different shape. So it's, it's all questions of time and space. But always the truth told inside that. So all of those are frames. And they shouldn't be something to be afraid of. I worked as a guy named Jimmy Glennon. He's one of my best friends. He died two years ago. He was the operator on Altered States. Yeah. I'm godfather of his daughter. Um, he would stay with me after work. It was my first feature. He would stay with me until 2 or 3 o'clock every morning. And he would show me what, what, what lenses do. He would show me what prisms do. He would show me how space and time are bent by different by different lenses, how you coordinate your movements from a wide shot to a narrow shot, how you adapt all that stuff and make it work so there's verisimilitude from the master shot to the cover shots to the over the shoulders to the close-ups. He would help me understand that it was a form and I didn't want to see it as millions of people judging me personally because you, you don't know me. But, and who cares about me? It doesn't matter. What matters is the work that we share. He helped me understand it as a form. But they never did that for me at Juilliard. <laughs> you know, film is this huge aspect of the theatrical expression. How come they're not teaching these things at schools? You know, the ancient ideas, Sophocles, structure, Shakespeare, compassion, Stanislavski, um, who, what, when, where, how, why, plus the various formats in which you express that. You know, they're just forms. So you are trying to learn how to express yourself inside forms, like life. And how then, lucky you were to have a tutorial well, like that. Well, but you have to, <laughs> and, and, and you have to ask. Yeah. Well, you used the word trust a moment ago, and a couple of years ago, uh, Glenn Close, who had been your co-star on Big Chill, was sitting in that chair, and when I asked her it's about <laughs> which, um, which directors had enabled her to do her best work and why. She answered Istvan Sabo, with whom you worked on <sighs> Sunshine, and she said, because of trust. Um, she talked about how he 
just had this sense on the, on the set of such trust that she felt she could do anything. I was wondering if, you know, for you, it was a similar experience, A, with Sabo, because Sunshine, if you haven't seen it, is this massive, brilliant, uh, epic three hours. It's a co-production of, like, um, Hungary, Canada, Australia, Germany, etc., tracing uh, a Jewish family in Hungary. And we showed a, a little clip from it. Four generations. It's Four generations, amazing, right. Yeah. Um, is Sabo Udayan Prasad on this film, how does a director create the trust that is like what enables you to, to do your best work? I don't know if you create it by do, being anything but trustworthy. I think um, it's like friendship. It takes a while. I mean, I have some very dear friends in, the, in this audience. I have some, my oldest friend is in this audience from when I was five years old. Very good. And, uh, and then I have a, a, some others who came along not long after. So it takes time usually. I mean, sometimes you know right away that you love somebody and you will love them forever. But, but it still takes time. So there's a way people have of taking time and of, and of showing you that they deserve your trust. I call it, from the time when I tried to figure out about Darwin and, and Einstein, long walks with trusted friends. That if you could take the, the hidden um, images of your instincts and allow them to fall on your tongue in the presence of, a, of, of, a, of someone who didn't judge you but was not a dupe, someone who didn't judge you but still had opinions, someone on whom you could try your ideas, that you might be able to bring your discoveries to shape. And I think it's true. To me, it's always been true that if I could spend some time doing what it is that I do anyway, which is researching through this art form, that's what I want to do. That's what I like to do. It just happens that way. In the presence of those who didn't panic, who didn't arbitrarily jump the gun, who didn't exhibit contempt prior to investigation, you know, prejudice itself, then I would explore myself in the least selfish way, and that that exploration might be useful to others. Hmm. So in their presence, the, pre the, the process of the greatest joy for a human being to me is, is curiosity. That in that process, you, if you can find someone <laughs> who loves you enough <laughs> to let you explore, uh, you have a really good chance of making a, a, a contribution. And is the exploration primarily during rehearsal, or is it sometimes improvisation when you're actually shooting? Well, improvisation is a technique, a very, very disciplined technique. Really great improvisation is as carefully um, set up as anything on a page. But it is a great art. Second stage in Chicago shows that every day. And all of the people who come out of there are some of the best improvisatory guys on the, on, on the planet. But there's real craft involved. How do you establish character? How do you establish given circumstance? How do you intertwine them? How do you interrelate with other people? All that stuff, there are rules involved. You can give them, I mean, you could cast out to the audience, you can say, okay, give me a given circumstance that I would never have to, oh, well, you hand her a newspaper and she says, and she whacks you with it. And blah, blah, blah. All of that stuff actually works on the basis of a whole lot of preparation you've done, guidelines that you institute, and ways that you research that on stage um, that give it form. Mm -hmm. Improvisation is a great form. It, isn't, it doesn't often start like that. So when Woody Allen, for instance, asked me to improvise on the, on the set of Alice, I really resisted for a long time. And I'm going, wait, you know, this is a script, you know, you know it was like, there are lines, right? There are lines, okay? And I know the lines. I don't know how to improvise in that character because I haven't studied his mind so that that mind can say these lines in that way 
off the cuff. Eventually, I did some. I didn't enjoy it. I don't like doing it capriciously or suddenly or without consideration. I don't believe in that. Hmm. I don't believe in in um, I don't believe in superficial work, and that's why I fight, you know, very hard for time. So you ask how I fight for rehearsal. I finagle, you know. I lie. <laughs> I <laughs> I don't lie much, but I. I, uh, I'll knock on your door at 3 a.m. and I'll, I'll work very, very hard to make that space. I'll give up pay. I'll arrive early. I'll give up any... I'll even promise not to tell you we did it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that reminds me. Is it true that you waived your salary, or at least part of it, so that Kiss of the Spider Woman could get made? Yeah, yeah. I think we, we made most of that on spec. Wow. Mm -hmm. well, but you know, there's a lot of a stuff like move. that going on. <laughs> I don't know if it was smart. It was from the heart. Yeah. It was definitely from the heart. Ra I, I, in fact, last night I went to see Raoul's son. He's doing a play downtown at the Flea, which is uh, a wonderful little theater run Sigourney. by Sigourney Weaver's husband, Jim yeah. Simpson. And, and Raoul, who I held like a puppy in one hand while I held my son Alex in the other like another puppy, uh, when we were doing Kiss of the Spider Woman is now uh, becoming a wonderful actor. And, wow. uh, and my son's at NYU, so. That's great. Yeah. Wow. Now, is there a particular role or film among the about 70 that you've done now that has stayed with you most, that has had a kind of deepest resonance inside you? There's a line that Chris Reeve had in a, in a play I did with him many, many years ago. It was our first play uh, off off Broadway. It was a play called My Life by Corinne Jacker. Oh, she, she yeah. was my colleague at Columbia. She's an amazing human mm -hmm. being and a great writer. And Jeff Daniels and Chris Reeve and I were in this play. Doug Watson was in it. Uh, Joe Henderson was in it. Uh, Marshall directed, Marshall Mason. And there was this line that Chris had, and, and none of us had made a film yet, by a long shot. We were just having a good time. And he had this line, my character was, was resisting making, bond, was resisting bonding, was resisting accepting his life, and resisting memories. He was cutting himself off from everything. And he can conjures this imaginary grandfather, and Chris was playing my imaginary grandfather. He actually, on his one day off, he would fly to London and audition for Superman. <laughs> He used to help him with his lines and say, this is going to ruin your career. <laughs> and um, he had this wonderful line. He said, uh, oh, my memories, my memories. Sometimes I take my memories out and I play with them like fine agate marble. Your mother's wearing agate yeah. tonight. And um, it reminded me of that a lot. And I keep something from everything. But I try to remember to keep something like a pearl, like an agate marble, from every single one of them. Like Chill, you know. He was better than that. He didn't sell his psyche for a little attention. He was better than that, classier than that. Um, every single one of them is, I, I, I remember. I remember the themes, the things I worked it around. I, I, I'll always find a few phrases, and I, and I, I'm like an oyster. I'll work around those phrases the whole time and bring everything to them. And I keep them on a necklace in my mind. Wow. Actually, I'm going to tell you something, and I, I, I suspect this audience has, most of you have not seen this film. If I had to choose one motion picture that you've made that speaks to me after all these years most deeply, it's one that is not even available these days called Until the End of the World. Oh, oh yeah. It was directed the long by. Version. Was that? The long version. The long, well, actually, yes. I saw the original four and a half hour version at a screening room at Warner <laughs> Brothers. This is a film that Vim Vendors directed in 90, 1991, in which, among other things, uh, you get to see the parents of William Hurt's character, played by Jean Moreau and Max von Sydow. I just worked with Max. Yeah, I worked with him with the Ridley Scott movie. He was playing, oh. yeah, he was right there. He's still cranking, man. In Nottingham. That one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's great. He's Fantastic. a millie. He's, 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 he's all there. 
Well, I, I've just learned that there is a DVD that was done in the UK, and I'm actually trying to get it here, because I, I, I rented the VHS, and it turned out to be the two-hour version, and it was defective sound. But I urge anyone who ever gets the chance to see this movie. It's a sort of poetic science fiction meditation that dovetails with some of the things you've been saying tonight. Um, because in, in the course of the film, I, I love how your character um, is capturing images because it's a camera in 91, the action is set in 99, trying to collect images for his blind mother, played by Jean Moreau, because the camera captures images that a blind person could see, you know, by going into a retinal thing. But after the mother has seen the images and died, the camera becomes a way for the two individuals to simply replay their dreams, mm -hmm. so that they become obsessively sort of solipsistic, just replaying and it, unable to move forward. But then at the end of the film, you understand everything begins with the word. Mm -hmm. And I thought this was one of the richest cinematic experiences I have ever had. Mm -hmm. And I, from that moment on, I became an even greater fan of your work than I had been. Um, I don't know why this film is unavailable. I don't know if you have any enlightenment. I was, I was, I saw Vim not long ago, and uh, and I can't answer that question. Um, it's a very important film. It's as important thematically as Dark City or, or some of the other films that um, that uh, don't run down the middle of the stream. Yeah, Dark City is another one that I recommend. It's it's science fiction. It's a fantastical film, but it's it's really about memory and the need for memory mm. is the only thing that'll prevent you from being taken over by the demonic, you know, mm. forces, the impersonal forces. I remember when Roger Ebert put that number one on his ten best list of the year, and I hadn't seen it yet. <laughs> I said, "What?" <laughs> and then I went to see it, and I thought, "Boy." You know, Kubrick wasn't the only one who can use science fiction to express some real serious questions it about was our lives. Wonderful project. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, we're going to take some questions from the audience. I know that some of you always take a moment if you have to leave to kids, park kids, your cars, kids. but but be aware that this film is opening February 26 from Samuel Goldwyn Films. Um, so before, if if anyone needs to leave, do it quickly and quietly, and then I'm going to take. <laughs> he's counting. I'm going to take some questions. I have immediately the gentleman here, the woman on the no. aisle, and. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, if you could just do it as quietly as possible, and I'm going to repeat the questions. This gentleman here. You're like a highly articulate technique walk. Wonk. Wonk. Sorry. Wonk. No question. Wonk. Given uh, your, your awareness, your sensitivity, how do you manage when you're on a set dealing primarily with cameras? For example, in the post-Katrina landscape, it's not the landscape you can see during your shots, but these cameras right up in your face. How do you deal with that? And shooting the scenes, and shooting the scenes out of sequence. Again, that's why I struggle so hard for rehearsal. It's uh, because if you can get a sense of memory of the experience by being unfettered, in other words, assuming the subjective state of the character, not as a schizophrenic act, and not as an act of acting out, but as an imagined act, playing like you play in the background, a backyard, you know, playing, you know, whatever you play in the backyard, um, with your buddies, uh, but, but seriously. Because what you're doing is you're posing a question. You're putting your imagination inside of this little crystal ball. And you're saying, okay, what if? What, if I'm human, and then what is, hum what is human? Well, human is character flung at destiny, like an atom flung at a razor blade, and you take a quick picture of the explosion, and that's your reflection of reality. That's your reflection of the truth. Just for one split second, you might, you might see out of the corner of your eye Truth, maybe for a second, but if you stared at it, it's going to burn your face off, like the golden bush. So, 
The idea is you build in rehearsal what Bergman called the conscience of the film. And then you surrender that conscience to what he called butchery, which was, the, which was filmmaking. But he, it isn't that he didn't love his technicians. He knew how hard it was for them. And it is incredibly hard and demands an amazing amount of, of dedication. I mean, incredible dedication from technicians. Um, but you want that conscience to survive the filmmaking. The issue in film is between shot administration and scene solution. Are you telling the truth about the scene, or are you just getting lost in administrating the shot? It's such a complex process, putting those little pieces together to make one shot. That's a very, very difficult thing. It's distracting. I don't know any definition of, of evil other than distraction. And, and so you're sitting right there. How do you, you, what you do is you construct a conscience, which is an authentic intention for your character. You, you, you get yourself very nailed into his given circumstances as a character origins, history, currency, and then, in, and then you fire that on the day based on an experience that you've already had somewhat but explore anew on that day. If you have that, you're, you're safe. Then you can pick up any scene on any day and it doesn't matter. If you don't, you're lost. You're in a panic, which is why I hate TV. <laughs> but, <laughs> sorry, but it's just panic-stricken. You know, you may, maybe you're going on instincts that you developed over time through tra training or something, but you're not saying, okay, I developed this conscience for this piece with these people in this unique situation. That's the problem. That's the problem. Thank you. That's really a brilliant answer, this gentleman <laughs> said. Uh, yes, Dr. Ruth. <laughs> Dr. Ruth? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> is it really? Yes. <laughs> Are you? Is it really? You're a hero of mine. <laughs> I can't believe this. <laughs> Me okay, too. I was particularly <laughs> grateful that you did not have a sexual been, encounter with the young woman. <laughs> that would have been really against the law, <laughs> even in France. I practice In front of the church. How did you practice in the arousal? There's a scene in front of the church. Uh, between the church and the steps of the church and the gas station. And she makes a huge decision, a life's decision in that scene. Because what she does is basically she offers herself to the one who's in the most control at that moment. She dares it in order to find herself. The very, very key scene, which uh, they let us play it out. And some of, that film, some of that scene was cut. Quite a large part of it was cut. We stayed in that stare for a long time where I'm telling her I know exactly what you're, what's going on with you, but not me. Not me. So you make a decision with every single person about that moment between the adolescent projection and the mature ownership. Some people don't know about that, and they sort of, they, they flip back and forth across that line, you know, even after long periods of their life, because they've left a part of their neurosis parked in, in, under a shelf, and they bring it out at some later date, and, you know, just, you know, beat up on the first person they see in the street. But, um, but that was a very key scene, where he's leveling her, he says, I've got, I know all your powers, I know all you got cooking, but there's a difference between a hormone and a thought. <laughs> and you're not having a thought right now. You're having a hormone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he says it very, very deliberately to her in a wordless way. And she understands exactly what he's saying. 
And from then on, you see that the nature of her relationship with him changes, with the boy, changes immensely. Because then she looks at him knowing him. Even for his weaknesses, she still be, then begins to see his strengths. Maybe that he doesn't see himself. So that's the process of maturation. That's the great reversal in the film. And that my character, after prison, can, can teach that wordlessly by accepting her offer as what it is and saying, excuse me, this doesn't make sense even to you. <laughs> now think about it. You know, which you've asked many Americans to do. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ruth is a wonderful cinephile. She loves movies, and she has good taste in movies. <laughs> you're a hero. You're, you're, you're uh, here. Yes. Wow. Wow. I'm wondering about which actor or movies or plays influenced you most while you were growing up. I was thinking about that. You know, which actors or movies or plays influenced you, pushed you into this decision to be an actor? My mom, we, we used to skip to the RKO. So it was John Wayne, and I was like, then <laughs> I started thinking about other things. Um, I was very affected by all that, by the narcissism of America. And especially, and I'm still af affected by it, but I'm mostly angry about it. But in that time, you could take some self-centered, fairly intelligent person, and you could, you could wrap a morality around that person. Because they, they thought they were the center of the universe, which of course all people do. Um, and if you bought enough people around him to ratify <laughs> that opinion, you could lace that consortium with a moral point of view and have it come off as a moral idea. Um, as the peripheries of film begin to drop away, uh, where you get center-weight heavy movies, where you get one or two or three people in the middle of it who think they're the center of the universe, but they don't give anybody else in the peripheries of the film a chance to think the same thing. The old movies, everybody thought they were the, the center of the world. You had a guy come on for a day player, and he had a lifetime in vaudeville. He didn't care if you were Gary Cooper. You know, he was doing his job. And he was just as important as you were, so you had a scene. Then that resonance began to slowly be lost as Hollywood began to, to sell easy. And they sold easy on the basis of, as far as I'm concerned, a sequence of stars that they manufactured who were self-destructive. And I think it says something about, I think Dr. Ruth could probably talk about this, better than me, about the, the, the particular sort of social pathology that was bred in that time. Um, I was very affected by the old movies. I, when I first watched TV, I used to watch the fuzz. I mean, the shh, you know, the, I was amazed. I just read the introduction to a book called um, A Short History, A Brief History About Just About Everything. And he talks about that as being the sound of the Big Bang. Um, my favorites were Gracie Allen. My favorites were uh, Jack Benny. My favorites were Abbott, Abbott and Costello. My favorites were um, Amos and Andy. I mean, you can't say it anymore, but it was true. Uh, the there were characters riddling uh, TV like, like our game. I'm sorry that Kubrick turned the corner and began buying his budgets with stars. It happened during Barry Lyndon, which is one of the greatest movies ever made, except for the center. Um, then he moved on, he continued to do it, but that's because he was trying to make great movies, but he just had to fight so darn hard for his budgets. That displacement of what I call the resonator between the center of the film 
and the periphery of the film is a great dearth in, 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 the, in the art form. And I've, and I've suffered from it. But where I fixed it was in my study at Juilliard and um, in repertory ensemble, which is still my ideal. And it's, what I, it's the only thing I care about. Hmm. Wow. Yes, on the aisle there. Where do you put yourself when you are becoming these characters? Did I hear that right? And then what happens to yourself? And how did your own self evolve being involved with all these characters? It's been a journey. The first great question I ask myself is, is it acting or acting out? And I worked on that for a while because I was, like most people, insecure and wanted attention, but when I was concentrating deeply, I, I stepped aside from that. So I had two experiences. One was, me, one was the me who wanted to please other people, and one was the guy who didn't care, who <laughs> didn't care at all. I was so interested in it that I didn't have time to be interested and care about whether anybody was interested in me. After a while, that crescendoed into a confrontation, a real confrontation. And I began to see it very clearly, the difference between what I call getting attention and paying attention. See, to me, if I'm doing my job right, you should be, you could be, shunting off of me toward the subject. But don't look at me. I mean, it's like some people come up to me in the street and they go, it's not, it's not, aren't you who I think you are? <laughs> and I go, well, you know, I know very few things in life, for sure, but I'm positive I'm not who you think I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure of that. <laughs> so this question of acting and acting out or personality versus character became very big issues for me very early on in my teens. And, uh, and then in college, it began to develop more because when I was acting out or in any way serving my insecurity, I was a little bit out of control. But when I was paying attention, I was in full control and yet at the same, st same time in a state of complete discovery. So I was just as excited. I was more excited by being in control but making great relevant discoveries while in the act of exchanging ideas on stage that were fully developed with other intelligent actors in well-mounted productions that enriched me. And that became the life I wanted. So that's the life I've had as an artist, and, and that's what I want. That's what I'm glad about, mostly. <laughs> yes, here and then... So there have been some other things, too. Yeah. This is a question, um, given the emphasis on discovery, including the way that the audience is discovering, the actors discovering their characters, the scene in the film where uh, Brett is booked at the police station, and then finally, all of a sudden, he's outside, you know, could you talk about that ellipsis? I love the fact that you're paying attention to your instincts. I mean, I, I wish, you know, every, we all did, and, um, and you're absolutely right. That scene was much more elaborate. There was, uh, a conf there was a meeting between those characters. There was a conversation between those characters. There was other things that happened while they were conversing. There were other sub you know, subsidiary characters in involved, wondering how can this be? Who are these guys? Why are they pals? Blah, blah, blah. And then you found out a lot of past material about Brett, uh, but they cut it. You're absolutely right. In fact, 
that instinct goes, and if you read a lot of scripture, you'll see where the cuts are that were made on a computer editor. You can tell. Mm -hmm. An organic tendril, it, it is a mistake, as far as I'm concerned. And that's because I believe in, in my, that the actors that came into that scene were not as well rehearsed as I had been. Mm -hmm. And so they couldn't, they couldn't fulfill their lives to the, to, the, to the fleshy extent that we could. And the, and, the, and the disproportion was so obvious it looked garish <laughs> in the cut. So they got to cut it. And that they hoped that the subterranean establishments of the other characters then carries you across the gap. Which is, happens a lot in movies, a lot. And unfortunately, most movies are actually made stapling together stuff rather than allowing ensembles to come together and work together to the fulfillment of all of their natural intelligent questions. People are intelligent. People are intelligent. That's a fact of my life. I can't see a human face without intelligence, maybe even genius in it. I see lots of faces that don't know. But the industry doesn't know that. The industry doesn't treat us like that. CNN doesn't treat us like that. Fox doesn't treat us like that. <laughs> so they don't know a lot about us, do they? Excuse me for being so afraid. No, it's all right, but fortunately you still get to do the work. Yeah. And we get to moment, benefit from it. Some so. people don't, but, I, but I, I'm lucky. Yeah. I'm very fortunate. There was a question right there. I am obsessed with the Good Shepherd. He says, I am obsessed with the Good Shepherd. I consider it one of the best movies of the past few years. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question, could you talk a little about your experience on The Good Shepherd and the actor who played Gordy, Eddie Redbane, was he in The Good Shepherd too? He plays Matt's son yeah. at the end. Uh, it's, it's important for me too. Um, I mean, De Niro is one of my heroes and you're in the same room with this guy and he's been carrying a big load for a long time. And, um, it, the experience for me viscerally was a, was a grinding. Um, Robert, I think he must come from Italian marble quarry people, <laughs> you know, because he, he carries big loads and he never quit. I think his genius is in his legs. And he just keeps grinding until he grinds some truth out of you. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm sure that the film completely articulates the intelligence of its question. Um, the origins of that, of our state, of, its, of the nucleus of our soul as a, as a nation. It's a big, this is a big topic. Um, I think my answer probably is, why are they bandying around this word uh, transparency? When we can't possibly hire a president to hand Putin our nuclear codes. <laughs> Capitalism isn't based on transparency. <laughs> it's based on winning. So we can't, you know, so that goes to the nugget of the question. How do you protect yourself as an entity? and still be free. When does the secret own you? Oh, it's an amazing question. Actually, when does the secret that you keep to protect yourself own you? When do you become unknown to yourself because you keep it? Wow. Well, Actually, as you were describing that, all of a sudden I flashed onto another film, if, if I'm remembering this correctly, that you made around the same time, Syriana. Yeah. Is there not a scene, is it Syriana where, is it Tim Blake Nelson and Jeffrey Wright have mm. this dialogue about capitalism mm. is what enables you to go to bed at night safe, protected, whatever. It seemed almost like an extension of what you were talking about here. Another motion picture, I think. I, I, you've been actually in so many wonderful ensemble pieces. You know, when we, we showed some clips that were primarily of films in the 80s that you clearly were the star of. Mm. We didn't show as many clips 
films like Smoke or Syriana or The Good Shepherd, these ensembles where so much comes from these nuances, the dialectics among the various characters and what they represent. That, that idea probably represents me as an artist better. Um, the problem has always been stardom. If you look at the films themselves, you'll see interactions like that all over the place. But the system is based on this separation, uh, this isolating fact that we, we still need to see things through a given person. But I am nothing. I'm, I don't see it that way. I see myself as an actor among other actors. I, I literally do. And, um, and so that, that, that has always been one of, another part of the oil, oil water problem. Yeah. But I've approached it that other way. And it may have been, he, it may have been um, uh, wrong of me. It may have been proud or, or in some way um, indulgent. But is it not modest in a way when you're saying that it you're may just... Be, it may, may seem modest now, but I did it, you know, oh. so I don't know. Okay. We have a gentleman in the back who's had a hand up for a long time. Yes? Who is the sexiest See, actress you work with? See, that's the problem. Uh -huh. yeah. You are. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Um, you mean the, 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 the smartest? <laughs> uh. <laughs> this gentleman has had some amazing co-stars. I mean, off the top of my head, Meryl Streep, Marley Mathis. Sorry. No, 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 it's okay, it's okay, keep going, it's like, it's great. It's great. Uh, well, actually, at one point I jotted some of them down, well, Jean Moreau, you know, um, uh, Sigourney Weaver three times, hmm. Holly Hunter, uh, Max von Sydow, <laughs> no, I mean... Uh, yeah, I've had some great company. I mean, that, that to me is, is, the, is the, my treasure in my company, the company I've kept. Actually, you've worked more than once also with Forrest Whitaker mm. and Raul Julia mm. and others. So mm. I guess we're not going directly to the heart of your question, but that should be okay. There was also a hand down here that I didn't get to answer. There's no answer to that question. Do you ever have the desire to direct? Do you ever have the desire to direct? I've come close a couple of times, but I, I want paid rehearsal for actors, which they don't want to put into contract. They don't want the words in the contract. I also want crews cut into a s small, but I want them cut into gross after break even. I think crews make movies. And I would like to see a percentage of it set aside and prorated among the crews. Wow. They won't let that happen. I've been there, I've been close twice. In 11th hour, 59th minute, 59th second, they cut that out. They go, oh, we've got to push that because nobody does this. And you're going, well, then let's do it. Who makes movies? Who makes them? Who carries, you know, who picks up the rocks and carries the water? They'll never, the percentage guys will never cross the line into the salary guy's line. Yeah. Well, I think part of the problem, too, though, is you are still working so much. I mean, I just want to, a little research, I'll share this with you. It's not just that the film we watched is coming out in February. We also have um, the Moby Dick that you just shot for television, a miniseries for TV. Ridley Scott's Nottingham, the, the Robin Hood story with Russell Crowe, Kate Blanchett, and yourself. And I read, and I want to know if this is true, that you're going to be in Coriolanus, directed by Ray Fiennes and co-starring Ray Fiennes and Vanessa Redgrave. Hopefully, yeah. Well, because that, that mm. sounded like something I would want to show and that's, share with this group. That's really exciting. I, I, you know, we've been talking about it for a long time, but it's tough to get anybody to, to you know, come up with um, you know, financial support for iambic pentameter right now. <laughs> yeah, big pentameter. Although it's beautiful. Beautiful. But then again, you know, your career, your emer you emerged simultaneous with the rise of the independent American cinema to some extent. Mm. So I see the great work that you've done, not merely in terms of Hollywood, though you've done some wonderful Hollywood films, but you know, if you think about motion pictures like Kiss of the Spider Woman directed by uh, Hector Babenko, or Broadcast News, the, the original voice of James L. Brooks, and then taking that into the 90s, you know, Smoke with Paul Auster and, and Wayne Wang, mm. um, I think that 
the way films are being made in the United States allows increasingly for intelligence, sensitivity, lower budgets, and more time, yeah. as, as evidenced by The Yellow Handkerchief. And if my students at Columbia are any indication, the fact that they can now make films more cheaply and quickly has also allowed them to make more films that are more thoughtful and more moving. And you know, I'm just hoping that somehow this, this how do I put it, your, your, your life has been parallel on screen to these developments. So presumably it is possible to make the kind of film you're talking about, but outside of the Hollywood apparatus. My, I, I, I'm, it is eminently possible, and, I'm my, and my extra wish would be that they use trained actors. You know, thoughtful people. People who know how to uh, contemplate an issue and still breed spontaneity into the performance. Well, because I know we have to leave, I'm going to say, in conclusion, not all actors are as articulate, as thoughtful, as brilliant as you. Thank you so much, you for, much. for sharing this Thank hour you. with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.